Joining us now, Gershon Baskin, Middle East Director for the International Communities Organization. He initiated the peace negotiations that resulted in the release of Israeli soldier Gilad Shalit in 2011, and he's been trying to do the same now. Um, Gershon, we've talked to you a lot about this, and um, if anybody couldn't picture the person that you were on the other line with, now we know it's Ghazi Hamad, who we saw there. That interview, by the way, was done on October 24th, so more than a week ago. Um, when was the last time? It only just got surfaced, by the way. Um, when was the last time that you spoke with Ghazi Hamad? About four days ago, and then he went radio silent. He and all the other Hamas people that I've been talking to repeatedly since the beginning of this war and, of course, for many years before this war. So did you get any indication that this is how he felt? Well, we've had some very difficult exchanges since October 7th, in, including him saying that we will fight to the death and we're not afraid, and we will kill a, a lot of Israeli soldiers when they come to get us. They've been very difficult exchanges, in, but they were par for the course, I think, uh, knowing that we're in a war situation, they're being bombed, and the hor horrific things that they did inside of Israel on October 7th. Um, my continued talking with him had only one aim, and that was to try and get hostages freed, and, and hopefully to try and limit the number of innocent civilians who were killed in Gaza. Um, all the talking that I've ever done with Hamas or with anyone is for the aim of trying to save lives. But I understood that uh, something happened to Razi Hamad, and he w was a different person than the person that I've known for the last 17 or 18 years. Why are you surprised that he would say this? He, out of everyone that I've known in Hamas over the years, was the only person who actually demonstrated humanity on several occasions for the five years and four years that five years and four months that Gilad Shalit, the Israeli soldier, was held in captivity. There were many times that Razi Hamad was able to speak to me as a father, thinking about his own children. I, I tried to humanize the discussions when we talked about the fate of Gilad Shalit as much as possible. I've done the same thing with the bodies of the two Israeli soldiers, but more importantly with the two Israeli civilians who are alive in Gaza since 2014, Avera Mengisto and Hisham Asayed, who is even a Bedouin Arab, eh, who have been held in captivity. Um, I once told Razi Hamad about the pain of Avera Mengisto's mother, eh, of, of not knowing the fate of her son, and, and he came back to me once and please tell her that he's fine and we're taking care of him. So it was that kind of, maybe it was a lie, maybe it was false, but it was, it showed at least some kind of humanity in him that he understood the pain of a mother for her loss, for her missing son. So what changed? And what Razi Hamid said, when Razi Hamid said in that interview, and other interviews that he'd done since the war began, and when I learned that he wasn't even in Gaza anymore, that he escaped Gaza before the war, he had to know that this was coming at a time when I've been trying to convince him over the last months to spend a few days with me in Cairo for us to brainstorm together on how to break the deadlock between Israel and Gaza. And, and then I discovered he's in in, in Beirut, being the primary spokesperson justifying what Hamas has done. You also call out Qatar uh, in this letter, this open letter that you've written. Um, you say that Qatar is, you know, housing Hamas. Do you think Qatar is a reliable negotiating partner right now to try to get these hostages out? Look, the, the Americans put a lot of weight on Qatar because America's largest military base in the Persian Gulf is there. And there are a lot of interest, apparently. But if we're going to be honest with ourselves, there's no way of not saying that Qatar is a state, is, isn't a state that supports terrorism. It has housed the leadership of Hamas for years. It has funded Hamas with more than a billion dollars over the years. It runs an, the Arabic Al Jazeera, which espouses the ideology of the Muslim Brotherhood and supports Hamas all of these years. And uh, if the Americans were willing to compromise their interest in Qatar, the Americans would have told the Qatari leadership, you have to tell Hamas that they have 24 hours to release hostages, and if not, you should expel Hamas. And if Qatar doesn't do that, I believe 
the Americans should list Qatar as a state that supports terrorism. And let's see what happens to the billions they spent on the World Cup and on Qatar Airlines and all the investments they're making in Wall Street and Silicon Valley and the properties they're buying up in London. A state that supports terrorism cannot engage in the economic economy of the world in the way that it does. And I think the Americans need to be a lot tougher with Qatar. So Secretary of State Antony Blinken is going to do another round of shuttle diplomacy. Presumably he'll be talking to the Qataris at some point. Why don't you think the Americans take that tough line with the Qataris? I think there are interests involved, as I said here, not only the military base, but Qatar has also served a American interest in other hostage situations, in negotiations with Taliban, in, in negotiations that happened with groups in Iraq. So I guess they found them useful. My personal belief is, and I've said this from the very beginning, that the best possible channel to Hamas is Egypt. Egypt is a neighbor of Gaza. Egypt has been the primary negotiator in achieving ceasefires in the past. Egypt has direct contact with the decision maker in Gaza, who is Yahya Sinwar, who's deep in the tunnels underneath Gaza. He is the head of the political and military factions in Hamas, and he is the person with primary responsibility. I don't think that the Qataris are talking to the decision makers in Hamas talking to Ismail Haniyeh or Khalid Mashal or the other Hamas dignitaries who sit in five-star hotels and are living it up with, with Qatari head, a, 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 a protection are not the people who can deliver the hostages. The hostages are in Gaza. We need to be talking to the people in Gaza. Do you think there's still opportunity to get the hostages out, to get the children out? There's no doubt that the clock is ticking. Um, the decisive moment will be when the Israelis enter the tunnel system in Gaza. And I don't know how they're going to go about it. I'm sure there's all kinds of technologies and probably robots and explosives. But once they're in the tunnels, once the fight moves from the streets to the tunnels, the hostages are in direct harm's way. They are standing between the Israeli army and the Hamas the militants who are holding them hostage. And, and then we're at a decisive moment where it might be that the Israeli government is saying in order to achieve the larger goal, which is removing Hamas's ability to ever threaten Israel, we have to sacrifice the hostages, those yeah. who we can't save. And that's a very sad moment because Israel has a moral responsibility to bring those hostages home. Yeah, it's horrible to think about. Let me ask you about the Palestinians um, and the Gazans. You, you also write in this letter that Hamas has done nothing for the Gazans. They built tunnels and uh, bunkers that they haven't built a, a single shelter for Gazans. Is that something that you hear from Gazans, anger toward Hamas? Because I, I haven't heard it in the interviews that I've been able to do. Yeah, I, I haven't heard it during the war, but I heard a lot of this before the war and in the years previous. I get a lot of phone calls from people in Gaza. They know that I'm someone who's helped other people in Gaza. There's a, a young woman student who we raise money to send her to university to learn computer science. And other people, uh, uh, another woman whose who's sister's home and, and her sister and brother-in-law were killed, and they were left with five children, orphans, and I raised a lot of money for the family. So I get phone calls from people all the time asking for help, and the first thing I do is tell them to go speak to Ghazi Hamad, because he was the minister for social affairs, and Hamas is supposed to take care of their people. And the response, even from people who did go to call them, most of them said, we're afraid to go to Hamas. Most people said Hamas only helps their own people. They won't help us. The common citizen in Gaza was not helped by Hamas ever. And, and now Hamas is responsible, directly responsible for taking them back 75 years. And what we're witnessing is, is a trauma equal to the Nakba, to the catastrophe of 1948. And you're saying Hamas is the one that, that instigated this? Hamas in their terrorist attack, in their refusal to negotiate long-term understandings. Look, I'm not removing responsibility from Israel for one moment. Israel is, is guilty of occupying another people for 56 years and not willing to grant the Palestinian people liberation, freedom, self-determination, the right to have a life of respect and dignity, just like Israelis want for themselves. So there is blame on Israeli soldiers' shoulders as well for the continuation of this conflict. This is a very difficult conflict. We have had a failed peace process, and, and Mr. Netanyahu and his allies 
together with President Trump and others, help to remove Palestine from the agenda of Israel and from the international community. And therefore, the United States and others have a burden of responsibility as well. How long can countries in this world talk about a two-state solution and only recognize Israel? It would have been so much better years ago if we had put the two-state solution up front, if the United States and others had said, we recognize the state of Israel because we want a two-state solution, and let's help two states negotiate borders, in Jerusalem, refugees, economic issues, et cetera, et cetera. But when you leave one side in control, with no symmetry in this conflict whatsoever, we have the occupier and the occupied. We can't expect that after all these years, we're going to have peace if we don't work to really make peace.